Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scare to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. It's me. Hello, Lin- Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's you. That's you. I'm feeling good today. Are you pep? Did you have caffeine this morning? What's going on with you? Uh. uh <laughs> did you? Busted. <laughs> yes. Well, because I'm I'm on this new anti-inflammatory diet mm-hmm. to help with some internal body issues, mm-hmm. and I'm only a few days in, and so I'm feeling a bit sluggish as I'm adjusting. Uh-huh. And so I was like, oh, uh- I don't, I don't want to be all. <sighs> so. well, you're, you're not you're not you are not ha huh? you are I'll, I'll be you good, are though. pepped up i um, will i will keep it under control <laughs> we, we hope 2021 is finding you well and uh regarding your messages that have just been coming in about last week's episode we don't know what knocked the dolls off uh joe if he did it is not confessing so i think i think it will remain a mystery did i tell you that um long after the episode mm-hmm. like maybe even the next day i came in to the studio to do something and one of the dolls was lying down on the table no, uh uh-uh. uh. And, and there was no reason for it because right. the, the show was done. We had cleaned up. We'd put everything away. There was no reason for her to be just lying there. Who knows? Maybe some of the show energy is getting pushed into one of those little dolls there or Possibly. one of our many creepy dolls. Uh, happy birthday to <gasps> Kyler. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's not my birthday the, the episode comes out on Kyler's birthday yeah. So yeah, Kyler Cummins, happy birthday right. 15 mm-hmm. 15 years old And Monroe's birthday was just three days ago mm-hmm. So happy birthday to Monroe as well 13, we are deep in the teen years Yep, we're in the midst of it Someone say a prayer <laughs> uh, They've been very good so far So no, hopefully that continues No, they're great kids, we're so lucky uh, Very cool Crystal Queen Loki champion crew neck sweatshirt in the store now at badmagicmerch.com just wait i'm gonna wear it non-stop it looks awesome it's dope uh email store at badmagicproductions.com for any merch related customer service questions you have and then a quick donation reminder before we get into the stories this month we donated 20 percent of our patreon subscriptions uh company-wide to the riggins idaho emts able to cut them a check for eleven thousand six hundred. Grandma Betty's going to be happy to deliver that personally. Yeah, good good job, guys. Thanks. Yeah, going to go a long ways to keep their equipment up to date, keep them transporting those living in the Salmon River Canyon around Riggins, very rural area, uh, you know, able to be transported to the hospital that is very far away. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. Just Mm -hmm. like a a tiny side note here. Yeah. Uh, Previously, before your grandfather passed away, I remember your grandma calling to tell me that they had taken him to the emergency room at one point. Yeah. And she was like, you know, so I called the ambulance. And I was like, the ambulance? She yeah. goes, yeah, there's only one. And it was out on a run. So you have to we, wait. You have to wait. Yep. And I mean, I just, I grew up in a suburb of a large city. Mm-hmm. So I just could not wrap my head around the idea that in 2020 at the yeah. time that that was even like a fucking possibility <laughs> anymore. One ambulance? And they're lucky to have one. I know. So I'm so excited because I think this money, it will go so much further for such a good cause. Yeah, me too. Yay. And you can go to facebook.com slash Riggins Ambulance if you would like to find out how to donate yourself. There's an email and phone number listed there. And uh, and that's it for announcements. So, that's it. So previews, uh, you said you had one story, which is different I for have you. one big Fat, delicious, juicy story. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'm back down to two. Okay. Uh, been a while since we had a black-eyed children in oh, Countertail. Oh, fuck. So starting off with no. one of those from a hotel in Europe. I think my favorite one so far. No. Can uh, I leave now? And s- I'm going to set it up with some uh, additional BEK mythology we have not explored before. And then for our second tale, we're going to head to Scotland's Glam's Castle. Very famous castle. Mm-hmm. Uh, a place that uh, inspired Shakespeare partially to write Macbeth. I see you're getting some chills. I know. I already have the chill. I'm thinking about the Black Eyed Children. <laughs> and, and we're going to share some of this castle's dark history and centuries of sightings. Yikes. So so decent amount of setup for the first, um, for the story, the Black Eyed Kids story. You want to you settle in? Yeah. I just want to say one thing about why I'm particularly freaked out about doing the Black Eyed Children. Okay. Because last week I had my very first ever sleep paralysis. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll talk about it later, but... I, I don't know, just the combination of knowing that that is something that can happen to me. Yeah. And then I hate the black eyed children. 
the fucking most. <laughs> More than aliens, they are top of the list for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, check out these socks. Western Kentucky University. Thank you, Christopher. Is it White House? Whitehurst. Dang it, I knew it. Uh, thank you for my fancy little fuzzy socks. <laughs> Okay, so haven't talked uh, for a while um, about one of Lindsay Liu's favorite entities, uh, the black. And sorry about my voice; it is fine. Ninety, then it's like it's happened to me in a recording yesterday. It's fine. Go, totally hydrated. Go into the recording, and then suddenly, just like that little frog, and I, yeah. I feel it's like, ah, uh, why are you back there? Well, <clears throat> I know what would help if you would put your oh teeny God. tiny <clears throat> little Excuse humidifier me. that I got you next to your bed. You would be hydrated all night maybe, long. Maybe, maybe the dry winters of uh, Coeur d'Alene. They're rough. Uh, before I tell a tale uh, of this recently claimed encounter, uh, first I want to share some additional BEK related folklore. I don't think I've shared here before. While the overwhelming majority of black eyed children sightings have been reported since 1996, when Texan Brian Bethel first described encountering two such creepy childlike beings in Abilene. Lore regarding these evil-seeming entities, who typically appear as children, with all black eyes, has existed for several centuries, at least. Woven into the mythology of some of the tribes of the Iroquois American Indian Tribal Confederacy, there are tales of a dark power called the Otkin, a power that can take over the souls and bodies of children. Hmm, great. And there are stories of an evil one who would mate with human females to produce black-eyed, chalky skin, human-like offspring filled with octon. These children, according to the old stories, were killed soon after birth, and then their bodies burned to keep them from resurrecting and bringing death to whatever village they were born into. Also, in addition to some children being born as black-eyed children, some previous healthy children, previously healthy, uh, wandering alone in the woods would sometimes be taken over by Otkin and would reemerge from their wanderings with black eyes and pale skin, typically giving themselves away by acting suspiciously nervous, uh, by often repeating themselves over and over again. They acted like something inhuman, desperately trying to pass itself off as human. Once transformed, the goal of the transformed was to destroy the tribe its human passenger came from to infect all the people with the Otkin that now infected them. Some historical accounts have stated that the Mohawks of New York State's Mohawk Valley believe strongly in the ex <clears throat> oh my god that's annoying in the existence I cannot get rid of it it's of, okay. do, of witchcraft do you need some water you know if you could talk for a second let me pound more water yeah okay well what would you guys <clears throat> like to talk about uh, yeah so for those of you out there who have kids man <clears throat> these uh, teenage years a little bit stressful. <laughs> maybe I was just already thinking, oh, they repeat themselves. Kyler likes to repeat himself a lot. So I think maybe teenagers are just incantations of black eyed children. That's my opinion. How you doing? Uh, that was my fifth glass of water this morning. So hopefully that will maybe take care of it. I've been drinking so much water. Maybe you need like some throat coats or a I lozenge. I don't know. It's just an annoying sinus stuff my whole life. Um, okay. So. Some historical accounts have stated that the Mohawks of New York State's Mohawk Valley believe strongly in the existence of witchcraft, and you could learn to be a sorcerer of sorts and wield the negative power of Otkin, a power granted to you by the Evil One, a.k.a. the Evil-Minded One. The Evil-Minded One, considered to be the father of the Black-Eyed Children, was a Satan-like being who some said took the form of a reptilian snake man. <gasps> And the evil-minded one was constantly trying to manifest itself in human form th the, uh, through its black-eyed demonic offspring. And these offspring were said to be ferocious, cruel, and often had a taste for human flesh. There's also folklore from India related to the black-eyed children, stories of the Akari. While some uh, sources say this creature comes only from Hindu mythology, hmm. most sources seem to say they show up in both Hindu and in some tribes' American Indian mythology. An, uh, an Akari is believed to be the ghost or spirit of a little girl who was either murdered or hmm. abused and left to die. Now she has returned from her cruel death to exact revenge amongst the living. The Akari are said to come down from mountains and hilltops at night to bring sickness and death to humans living below, particularly to children. They are often depicted with dark, unnatural eyes and are sometimes referred to as hill fairies. Hill fairies? That sounds way too nice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the most effective defense against an Akari is said to be a red ribbon tied around a child's neck or woven into their clothing. Do you, oh, never mind. <laughs> Salt is also reported to provide protection. Salt either lined around one's property boundaries to keep the acre out or, uh, you know, kept in leather pouches and carried by children to keep the acre from touching and harming them. I believe that. And the acre, like those infected with the Otkin, are said to bring sickness and death to those they encounter. They are a female, possibly demonic entity that feeds on human misery and despair. 
In many old stories, the Akri are seemingly indestructible. However, there's an American Indian Chippewa tradition that says that wrapping the red cloth of a medicine woman around the creature's neck will send it back to its grave to rest peacefully forever. Okay. And if this next story is to be believed, these dark-eyed entities, maybe the Akri, maybe children infected with Octon, maybe something else entirely, they might still be around. Mm Mm-mm. And they might not uh, be local to only North America and Asia. This next encounter allegedly took place in Europe. Time now for the tale of the unexpected visitor. Fatima writes that she hails from Michigan, the Grand Rapids area, and that several years ago she uh, had what she referred to as the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go on a European vacation with her girlfriend Natara. And everything was wonderful for the first few days. The duo stayed two nights in London and enjoyed many of the old city's traditional sights. They toured the Tower of London, saw the Queen's Guard in front of Kensington Palace, snuck in a romantic dinner near Leicester Square, and enjoyed a walk through Kew Gardens with weather not typical of London, warm and dry. They then took a train to Dover and hopped on the high-speed train that travels under the sea via the Channel to France. And after catching another train during their second night in Paris, Fatima claims to have experienced the following. Late at night, somewhere around two or three in the morning, she awoke to the sounds of crying that seemed to come from the hallway outside her hotel room. At first, she tried to ignore it. Then, when she couldn't ignore it enough to fall back asleep, she laid on her back in bed a while, trying to determine what on earth could be going on out there. A child crying in one of the other rooms? Fine. A child having trouble sleeping, maybe waking from a nightmare, maybe not feeling well? That also made sense. But a child crying in the hallway at this hour, and to go on for as long as it had, that made no sense whatsoever. Maybe the kid wasn't in the hallway, she thought. Maybe it just sounded that way? Some type of auditory hallucination? But what if it wasn't? Fatima kept waiting for Natara to wake up so she could talk to her about it. But she didn't stir. Natara was sound asleep in bed next to her, snoring in fact, and eventually Fatima decided she couldn't wait any longer to try and find out what was going on. She quietly rolled out of bed and tiptoed over to the door. As she approached it, she heard what sounded like someone pacing back and forth, directly outside their room. She still heard the crying, it seemed to be coming from whoever was doing the pacing. She said she felt about half scared to death as she moved closer to the door. She looked out through the peephole and then immediately recoiled, startled. There was what appeared to be a child of around nine or ten years old standing directly outside the door to her room, facing the door, and staring directly into the peephole. Fuck. And something about this kid scared the living shit out of her. Her skin was too pale, and something was wrong with her eyes. And although she had just glanced at her for a moment while the sound of crying continued, Fatima noticed that her mouth was shut. So who was making the crying noise? Could there also be a baby out in the hall? Was someone else out there crying? That would be the reasonable explanation for continuing to hear that sound, but in her gut, Fatima knew it wasn't true. She knew in her gut that the sound came from this girl on the other side of the door. And then the crying stopped, and Fatima heard a voice. (gasps) Let me in. Uh Uh-uh. Please, let me in. Oh, my God. It was almost human. Almost. A bit robotic. She felt that if she'd been watching the girl while she said this, her lips would not have moved. She looked back out through the peephole. Chills. The girl stood directly outside, still staring directly back into Fatima's eyes. This time, Fatima did not look away. She stood frozen and kept staring. The girl's eyes. There was something hypnotic about them. Jet black, without a sliver of white or any other color to be seen. Two obsidian orbs where human eyes should be. They were terrifying. As she stared, the voice returned, and her mouth still did not move. Let me in. Please, let me in. The voice had a slight menacing quality to it now. It made her feel a bit sick to her stomach. She also wanted to, against her better judgment, open the door. No, 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 no. She felt as if she was under this thing's spell. To her horror, she watched her hand grab the door handle. It felt like an out-of-body experience. Stop. She didn't want to open the door, but that's exactly what she was now about to do. What's going on? Asked Natara from behind her as she sat up in bed. Fatima hadn't heard her begin to rise, and she screamed out. What is it? Asked Natara, who was now quickly standing up and moving towards the door. Don't open it, warned Fatima, in a quiet hiss snapped out of her trance. Something's out there. What? Asked Natara. She was now wide awake. There's a girl in the hallway. 
Fatima urgently whispered. Her crying woke me up. I went to check on her, but something is really not right with this kid. Her eyes are black, and she doesn't move her mouth when she talks. Are you sure you weren't just dreaming? Asked Natara. No, she's right on the other side of the door. I saw her twice through the peephole. Fatima then turned around to look back out into the hallway, and the girl was nowhere to be seen. Uh. She also realized the crying had stopped. She's gone, she whispered. Let me look, said Natara, who tried to step past Fatima and grab the door handle before Fatima blocked her. No, she said. She could still be out there. Be, just be quiet and listen. They both stood perfectly still and listened for several moments. Nothing. Fatima looked back through the people. The hallway appeared to be totally vacant. Just let me look. You said it was just a kid, pleaded a very confused Natara. Fine, said Fatima, oh, no. but be careful. Stay close to the door. If you'd seen this thing, you would not be heading out there. Okay, said Natara. I'll stay close. And then she slowly twisted the door handle, cracked it open a few inches, and peeked out. Nothing. She then carefully and quietly opened it enough to bend her head around and look down the hallway in the other direction. Still nothing. She opened it wider and stepped on out, looking both directions again. She was confident she was the only person in the hallway. Their whole floor seemed to be sound asleep except for them. Natara whispered to Fatima, There's no one out here, love. Just me. You must have just had some sort of dream. Maybe you were sleepwalking. Fatima then stepped out in the hall, first opening the lock on the door so that it couldn't close behind them and shut them out. Natara put her arm around Fatima's waist, drew her near, and kissed her on the cheek. It was just a nightmare, she started to say, when the black-eyed girl stepped out in the hallway in front of them, popping out from another corridor about 30 feet away. Damn it! She was wearing a white nightdress, her bangs partially obscuring a face that looked almost human. Low and distressing, the sound of distant crying accompanied the girl's appearance. Are you okay, kid? <gasps> no. Asked Natara. The girl then wiped her hair from out of her face and revealed those two pitch black spots where eyes should have been. She smiled a large, open mouthed smile and revealed teeth that looked predatory, too sharp to be human, not fangs exactly, but close. She started to walk towards Natara and Fatima far too quickly. Will you let me in? She asked. I need to come inside to play with you. Fatima fought the pull of the thing's hypnotic gaze and flung the door to their room open wide, and the two women flew inside, Natara slamming it shut behind them. In what seemed like less than a second after entering, the thing from the hallway was now pounding on their door. Let me in! It wailed. Let me in! And then it screamed a primal, terrible scream. And then that scream cut off abruptly, and it was gone. They both looked through the peephole. Nothing. They called downstairs and asked for someone from security to come up and check things out. And when security arrived on their floor, they encountered no strange child in either their hall or any other. Natara and Fatima, and Fatima asked the security guard if he would check the security camera footage. He assured them he would. He called the room about 30 minutes later and told them that he had found the footage of Natara and Fatima creeping out into their hallway and staring at something. But whatever they were looking at, it just didn't show up on the tape. Oh my gosh. He also said that no one else reported any other disturbances. And with that, there was nothing else he could do. Fatima and Natara stayed up the rest of the night. They both were very glad to be checking out the following morning. The rest of their trip was free from any other black-eyed children encounters or sightings of anything else that seemed paranormal, thank God. They both remain convinced to this day that what they saw that night in Paris was all too real. And they both still wonder what would have happened to them if they had let that thing inside their room. Ay ay ay. <laughs> it's so intense because I can imagine that entire scenario unfolding anytime yeah. you've ever stayed in a hotel because there's so many noises that you don't know. Right, right. Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry about my, my voice. Hopefully oh, it wasn't okay. too distracting. No, it's fine. You know what I just realized, too? It's these in-ears. These type of uh, monitors. I, I keep forgetting about this when the show is over. Yeah. But um, when I plug up my ears oh. with these head, it changes the airflow. Yeah. And my sinus immediately starts to drain. Mm. If it's not, it's just that constant kind of al year round allergies I have. You should probably be using a neti pot. I gotta start. I just gotta start pounding water when I first come into the studio in the mornings and but, get it out of my system. Yes, but also... If yeah, you maybe were, the neti pot too. Because then it wouldn't uh, be blocked up and then you wouldn't have to deal with so much post-nasal mm -hmm. drip. My whole adult life. If you would just do the things I tell you. <laughs> uh, I I, show I'm some... a holistic guru. <laughs> I want to show some pictures uh, that, that, you know, go Coincide? along with the story a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this first one is the piece of Mohawk art depicting the octon. 
Oh, oh. This is now represented as two snakes surrounding a young black eyed kid painted on buffalo skin circa ni- the 1600s, found in Mohawk, New York in 1914 by Andrew J. Davis Jr. Now, if I saw that uh-huh. just uh, in some artifact museum, yeah. I would not make the connection to black eyed children. Right. Like you have to know like the legend behind mm-hmm. the image, like what it's supposed to represent. Well, even forget about like the, okay, you know, the snakes or whatever, but yeah. just the eyes being black, uh-huh. I just would have thought like it was a crude drawing. I wouldn't yeah. a- immediately associate that with anything nefarious. Right, right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then this next one is an illustration of the acre. Somebody's, you know, That's more modern sketch. Creepy. Mm-hmm. It's the like hill a... fairy, the little uh, formerly murdered child wandering down from the hills. She's like a very creepy haunted cabbage patch doll. <laughs> oh, yeah. It does have that look. And then this uh, this next uh, image is some cool artwork that accompanies a lot of acre stories uh, found out there on the web. That is creepy as fuck. <laughs> right? What if you have that hanging in your house and you just kind of forgot uh, about it? It's pretty cool artwork. I'd hang it. Nope. Nope. That's a hard no. <laughs> the last time you said that, uh-huh. the last time you said, oh, I would hang that, uh-huh. Logan got you a print of something. I know. And, and, I, and I am, t- Logan, no. Not in the house? And not that one. Oh, not that one. Yeah, nope, the other one's creepy. Any We're going to hang it. Yeah. Yeah, the other one, but it, this is like, huh. the other one's creepy in a different sort of way. Okay. And that one I could not handle. <laughs> so how are you, how are you uh, handling that, that tale? Uh, that not, was my favorite Black Eyed uh, Kids tale so far. Um, well, I don't ever like them. And I feel yeah. very anxious. Uh, it just it just feels so probable. I huh. mean, just possible. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, not that we're staying at hotels anytime soon, but yeah. we've stayed at just because of touring and just our life, you know, family out of town. Sure. Whatnot, we've stayed at numerous hotels throughout our lives. And, you know, I've stayed in hotels by myself or yeah. with you or with friends, or whatever. And I never sleep through the night in a hotel. There's always something you hear, you know, oh, your neighbor's yeah. door opening and closing. You uh, sometimes accidentally the front desk calls you instead of calling your neighbor for their wake up call. Or, uh, there's just so many sounds, the creaking, just everything. Huh. So hotels are really hard for me to sleep in in general. It's just too many new variables. And then you just add in the possibility of a black eyed child. I only thought of them as coming to your front door of your house. I didn't okay. think of them as being yeah, able. Places. Well, yeah, I mean the the their plan, their intention is to cross into any door that you will open to them, right? Yeah. So any door is an option, right. and I just didn't think of it that way. Just thought of an awesome practical <laughs> joke. Yeah. How great would it be if I got somebody to pretend to be a black eyed child and then come to our studio door when you're working late at night? <laughs> oh, that would be freaky. Mm-hmm. Yes, that would be freaky. I was actually sitting on the thought of um, just to plant this in your brain oh, of thanks. like uh, the hotel maids, you know, like when they come sometimes just to like ask if you need anything like housekeeping. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, are, are you okay? Do you need new towels? That kind of stuff. What if all the, you answer the door totally normal, like this person, so not a kid, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden their eyes blink just totally black and just stay that way how terrifying would that be how would you even pull that off i know that wasn't a prank i guess that was just like a, a possible got it paranormal terrifying scenario for you fair. to think about fair well thank you for that i'm so happy to have that embedded in my mind now when you travel again i sleep fine in hotels just so you know you sleep fine everywhere mm-hmm. speaking of sleep yeah my sleep paralysis I, now <laughs> it is like taking everything to a heightened level because i just It's not that I ever thought it wasn't Uh real. I just didn't think it could happen to me. So now in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going to see, I'm going to have sleep paralysis and I'm going to see a black eyed child in my sleep paralysis. And the black eyed child is going to try and come in through our bedroom door. I'm going to be mid sleep paralysis. I'm not going to be able to say no to it. And the child is going to open the door and come in itself. Even though I know that's not a thing, Uh you have to let it in. But okay, I am freaked out. I'm just fascinated right now with just like how your body processes caffeine. It's, it amazes me. I was thinking randomly the image of like Lindsay without caffeine is uh-huh. like, oh, let's think about Snoopy, the cartoon. <laughs> you know, like sometimes Snoopy will lay in his dog. Oh. Sometimes Snoopy will lay in his dog house and just be chill. Yeah. And then sometimes Snoopy fucking does his manic little dance uh huh, with his little Snoopy dance, just his feet and his arms straight on his sides. Yeah. No caffeine, you're sleeping. <laughs> laying up to caffeine. Ding, 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 ding. Like the little Charlie Brown music, whatever it is. Listen, it Ginger sharpens my mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, when you started the story, huh? I don't know where this comes from, but you said something about the red ribbon around the neck. Yes. There was a, a 
I don't want to call it a horse or it might have just been from Goosebumps, honestly. I, don't, I can't recall where there was a book that I read when I was, you know, middle school ish about a girl who had a red ribbon around her neck and she would never take it off. But when she did, then her head rolled off. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds very familiar. Do you like some kind of that? urban legend. I know, but I also. Oh, I genuinely, or a horror movie? That sounds very familiar. I genuinely remember it being a book. And I, I don't okay, know maybe. if Goosebumps did it or if it was. What was that show? Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yes, and I don't think I, I, I didn't watched have cable, that. So I think I watched it but at a friend's house. That story sounds very familiar. Mm-hmm. Eek! Anybody, anybody, a child of the '80s? Let me know what uh, <laughs> what what am I thinking of that I cannot place? All right, you ready to move on from Black Eyed Kids? Oh yeah. Do you think I can take this cross home tonight? You probably can. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think I think it's your right to do that. A little bit of historical setup for this haunted castle story. Tragedy has always found a home in Glam's castle. Nearly a thousand years ago in 1034, the king of the Scots, Malcolm II, was murdered in the royal hunting lodge that sits where Glamis, Glam's castle now sits. So hard not to say Glamis. It's spelled Glamis, clearly G-L-A-M-I-S, pronounced Glam's. No idea why. Uh, taking inspiration from this event, Shakespeare based the murder of King Duncan and Macbeth on this true story. Also finding inspiration in the spooky Scottish castle that would be built in the 14th century on the same grounds. A castle of massive red sandstone walls, which almost seem the color of blood in some light. An impressive castle of many spires, towers, and turrets reaching up towards the sky. It is a very impressive castle. The title of Lord Glam's, created in 1445 for Sir Patrick Lyon, and his descendants would hold on to this title for centuries and reside in the massive structure set on a sprawling and well-manicured 14,000 acres of land. Holy crap! It is a massive... Uh, Six generations later, John Lyon, sixth Lord Glams, married Janet Douglas, daughter of the Master of Angus, at a time when James V, another king of Scotland, was feuding with the Douglases. James V subsequently seized Glams' castle and lived there for some time before returning Glams to John Lyon, seventh Lord Glams, in 1543. These names are too much. I know. And And I'm like, what are you even (laughs) saying now? And the Lyons and their wives, servants, and descendants would inhabit Glam's castle until the late 18th century, when the Lyons finally chose to live elsewhere in Scotland. In their absence, Glam's castle was left in the care of an estate manager known as a factor. And in 1790, one of these factors spent a strange night in one of the castle's many rooms. He was told not to explore any of the other rooms after sunset. He was to go from the entrance of the castle straight to his room, stay there until morning. And he wrote a few lines in his journal about his stay later. I must own, as I heard door after door shut, I began to consider myself as too far from the living and somewhat too near to the dead. Translation, the factor heard a bunch of spooky ghost shit the night he stayed alone in the castle. Is that is that a um, a direct quote? <laughs> that's direct. That's direct, translation. Mm-hmm. And he left thinking he'd uh, heard the sounds of the dead. And he wasn't the first, nor would he be the last to claim he'd heard such sounds. Glam's castle has been rumored to have been haunted for many, many centuries. There are story after story about dark specters witnessed walking the dark halls and the winding staircases of Glam's. Who are these spirits? What terrible events befell them in life that left them trapped in a state of half-life, half-death forever? Time now for the story, time now for the tale, excuse me, of the ghosts of Glam's castle. In 1537... Back when the sixth Earl of Glam's John Lyne was married to Janet Douglas, who we just spoke of, John became embroiled in a heated feud with the Scottish King James V. Janet's brother, Archibald Douglas, sixth Earl of Angus, was the king's stepfather, and Angus had imprisoned James when James was a young man. And as James grew into adulthood, his hatred for the Douglas family also grew until one day it boiled over. In 1528, when John Lyon died, with no evidence to support his claim, James accused Janet of poisoning her husband. He also accused her of bringing supporters of Archibald Douglas into Edinburgh, men he said wanted to take the throne from him, a charge of treason. Luckily, other more credible threats to James's authority surfaced at the same time, and James dropped his charges against Janet to pursue these other dangers to his authority. But he never let Janet slip far from his mind. And less than a decade later, in 1537, he accused Janet of planning to poison him through witchcraft. Classic medieval vindictive power move here. When you have no evidence against a woman you want to punish, claim witchcraft. Janet was imprisoned with her second husband in a dungeon of the Edinburgh Castle. To gain evidence for her use of witchcraft, James had Janet and members of Janet's family and their servants tortured until they provided them with false confessions, the confessions they desired. Janet was found guilty on July 17th, and she was burned at the stake. Oh, my God. And her young son was forced to watch her die. 
As the flesh melted off her body and her screams grew louder and louder, spectators heard her say, I was not a witch, but now I will return as something evil. And ever since her unjust and painful execution, visitors to her former castle home have seen the mysterious shape of a spectral woman in a gray veil walking up the steps to the clock tower, only to disappear if they rush after her. In the chapel, guests have seen her pass through walls after regarding them before turning away and disappearing. Castle guests sleeping with their children in nearby rooms have long woken up to hear their children shrieking, screaming, or crying. When they rush to the rooms that have been locked all night, they've found their little ones with tears running down their cheeks. They've heard them shriek things like, She was here, the gray lady. When I woke, she was standing over me. She said she wanted me to go with her. And according to legend, when some children have agreed to go with her, she's uncovered her veil, revealed burnt and melted skin, ravaged by flames, and then asked, Do you still want to go with me? And the ghost of Janet Douglas, Lady Glams, is but one of several spirits thought to now roam the castle grounds. Another is the ghost of Earl Beardy. Near the servants' quarters lies a locked room where the castle's treasure was once stored. It was a perfect place to hide if you needed to disappear for a while. And that was exactly what Alexander Lindsay, 4th Earl of Crawford, nicknamed Earl Beardy, was hoping to do when he came upon the castle way back in 1453. Pursued by his enemies, he asked Lord Glams to hide him. In the treasure room, the two men played cards for hours until Saturday became Sunday. When Lord Glams realized that it was the Sabbath, he asked Earl Beardy to stop playing. It was considered unholy to gamble on the Lord's Day. Earl Beardy was angered by what he considered a foolish request. He became so furious that he decided he would play uh, until the devil himself came to stop him. Uh Uh-oh. Lord Glams then left the room, and then for several hours afterwards, servants later claimed they could hear Earl Beardy talking to someone, still playing cards against an unseen opponent. When one servant tried to peek through the keyhole, he allegedly keeled over dead. And when others finally managed to get the door open hours later, Earl Beardy was dead as well, clutching a losing hand of cards. Maybe just some folklore here, but are all the stories from Glams just folklore? The ghost of a young girl has also been spotted, seen by many witnesses over the years. She's been witnessed as recently as the first half of the 20th century. Sir David Bowes Lyon, former High Sheriff of Herefordshire, who died in 1961, once said he saw her while taking a late stroll on the lawn after dinner. He told others that he witnessed what appeared to be a young girl gripping the bars of a castle window and staring distractedly into the night. He was about to speak to her when she abruptly disappeared as if someone had torn her away from the window. Running into the building, he searched the room where he'd seen her, and she was, of course, nowhere to be found. He also was assured by all inside that there was no such girl in the castle, at least no living girl. Others have also shared stories about the girl in the window. And there is one last ghost that supposedly haunts the halls of the old castle, a ghost with perhaps the most disturbing backstory of them all, According to this old story, there is a secret in Glam's castle that runs so deep only three people have ever known of it at any given time. And those three people have gone to great lengths to ensure they're the only ones who know. One day, a serving maid stumbled into a room that was supposed to have been locked and she laid eyes on this secret, the castle's biggest. Horrified, she threatened to expose what she'd seen and according to castle legend, the Earl then ordered the guards to cut out her tongue which they did in the great hall, her blood spilling onto the floor, seeping into the rugs. The girl then broke free from the guards, tried to escape through the ground, still running even as her shoes slipped off, even as her feet were cut by sticks and rocks. And other guards ran her down in the forest and murdered her on the spot. They threw her body in a ditch, reported to the Earl that the girl was dead. The Earl then thought his problems were over, at least with his one witness. But as he surveyed the grounds at night, a short while later, he saw what appeared to be a girl running across the lawn, blood pouring from her mouth. She is alive, he said to himself, but as she, as he watched, the girl disappeared into the mist, leaving only a bloody trail behind her, which then slowly vanished. Was he going insane, the Earl wondered? Night after night, he and others saw the girl with the bleeding mouth, gesturing wildly, as though trying to tell someone something, before disappearing entirely. What was the secret she was carrying? It was a secret tied to only the Earl, the Earl's firstborn son after he reached manhood on his 21st birthday and the castle factor. On each Earl's son's 21st birthday, he would, be, he would have this secret revealed to him, a secret that threatened to damage the reputation and security of his entire family and their ancestors. The boy would be taken down a dark passageway to a small room in the depths of the castle. Then by tapping on a certain part of a wall, another door would give way to an even smaller room, and in this room was something hideous. 
Inside was a monster, a grunting and groaning thing covered with thick hair all over, a thing with no neck and small beady eyes, with arms and legs that were so small and spindly they could barely hold him up. He has been described as looking like a cross between a human and a toad covered in that coarse black hair. And this monster may have once been the rightful heir of uh, Castle Glams. It may have been a deformed human boy. Again, according to the legend, this poor child was born to the 11th Earl, Lord Glams, and his wife, Charlotte Grimstead, and he was born terribly, horrifically disfigured. He surprised everyone by living more than just a few hours after his birth, and he would go on to live a long life, in fact, but his parents knew he would never be able to lead the family. So they recorded that their first child was a son born and died October 21st, 1821, and they speared him away, spirited him away to the depths of the castle where the castle factor was assigned to care for him. Great care was taken to hide him, but sometimes witnesses, such as the girl missing her tongue, accidentally stumbled upon him anyways. A woman named Mrs. Bond would later recount her experiences as a maid in the castle glams in a letter to a historian. And one of her experiences was supposedly conjuring up a vision of this hidden so-called monster who was really just a shamefully abandoned boy. She wrote, It is a good many years since I stayed at Glam's. I was in fact but little more than a child and had only just gone through my first season in town. But though young, I was neither nervous nor imaginative. I was inclined to be what is termed stolid, that is to say, extremely matter-of-fact and practical. Indeed, when my friends exclaimed, you don't mean to say you are going to Glam's, don't you know it's haunted? I burst out laughing. Haunted, I said. How ridiculous. There are no such things as ghosts. One might as well believe in fairies. Despite my skepticism, after retiring to my room and having fallen into a deep sleep, I had a vivid, horrific nightmare. Slowly, very slowly, the thing, whatever it was, took shape. Legs crooked, misshapen human legs, a body tawny and hunched, arms long and spidery, with crooked knotted fingers, a head large and bestial, covered with a tangled mess of gray hair that hung around its protruding, protruding forehead and pointed ears in ghastly mockery of curls. A face, and herein was the realization of all my direst expectations, a face white and staring, pig-like in formation, malevolent in expression, a hellish combination of all things foul and animal. As I stared at it aghast, it reared itself on its haunches after the manner of an ape, and leered piteously at me. Then, shuffling forward, it rolled over and lay sprawled out like some ungainly turtle and wallowed as for warmth in the cold gray beams of early dawn. At this juncture, the handle of the chamber door turned. Someone entered. There was a loud cry, and I awoke. Awoke to find the whole tower, walls, and rafters ringing with the most appalling screams I have ever heard. Screams of something or of someone. For there was in them a strong element of what was human as well as animal in the greatest distress. Wondering what it meant, and more than ever terrified, I sat up in bed and listened. Listened whilst a conviction, the result of intuition, suggestion, or what you will, but a conviction all the same, forced me to associate the sounds with the thing in my dream, and I associate them still. Could this Mrs. Bond possibly be telling the truth? Could this creature have actually existed, hidden and trapped in the old castle? Or did she just have a vivid dream? While Mrs. Bond didn't actually see this boy, others have supposedly stumbled upon very real, hidden passages and witnessed something. Once a young doctor who was staying in the castle found on returning to his bedroom that some of the carpet had been rolled to the side. He went to work putting the carpet back where it had been, and while moving the furniture and raising the carpet, stumbled upon a trap door, which he forced open, and then he soon found himself inside a secret passage. This passage ended in a cement wall through which he could hear voices. When he called out to them, the voices quickly silenced, and after calling out again, and still hearing no one answer, he returned to his room confused. Early the next morning, he received a check for services he had yet to perform and was quickly whisked away from the castle, put on the first train leaving the station that morning. He would wonder for the rest of his days what was hidden from him that night at the castle. What did they want him not to find? In 1865, a carpenter also unexpectedly came upon a secret passage that ended in a door. Venturing in, the man saw a crouched figure at the far end of the room that appeared human-like, but maybe not quite human. He claims he actually saw the creature from Mrs. Bond's dream. Frightened, he fled. He reported what he'd seen to the castle factor, and within a few days, he claims he was then deported to Australia on false criminal charges. Nosy visitors haven't been the only people tossed off the grounds for either finding secrets on accident or purposefully searching for them. 
In 1850, the 12th Earl's own wife was banished. She threw a party, and late in the evening, after a considerable amount of wine had been drank, one of her guests suggested that it would be interesting to see if they could figure out the castle's secret, since the Earl was away on business. Someone suggested that the secret room probably had a window, and if they attached handkerchiefs to every window that they could find, they could then head outside and look up from the grounds and see if there was a window that they had not been able to find, a window that did not have a handkerchief visible. That would be the hidden room. Within a few hours, white handkerchiefs were fluttering from almost every window in the castle. Gathering out on the lawn, the party looked up at the house and located one window that had nothing. The secret room. They'd at least figured out where in the castle it sat. And then they heard a booming voice from behind them. What are you doing? Startled, they all turned around. It was Lord Strathmore, the Earl, returned unexpectedly early from his trip. They had never seen him look so furious, his face red, his eyes clouded and dark with anger. The guests quickly begged off, leaving the Earl's wife to defend herself alone. He was still screaming at her when the last guest departed. The next morning, a letter arrived for her announcing his intent to divorce her. She was left with no money, no home, no husband, all for her investigation of the secret. And the secret continues supposedly to remain hidden. Rose Levison Gower, Lady Granville, aunt to the current British Queen Elizabeth II, who was born at the castle in 1890, once said regarding this castle's secret, We were never allowed to talk about it when we were children. Our parents forbade us ever to discuss the matter or ask any questions about it. My father and my grandfather refused absolutely to discuss it. If something still exists in that secret room, it has to be long dead. Does a trapped specter remain in its place, still trapped in death inside the stone room it had once been trapped inside in life? Yikes. So here is an aerial shot of this castle. It is a extremely impressive castle. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Did you I, buy me that for my birthday? I did. I didn't want to say anything. Thank you. It's a, it's a, actually, I've, I wonder what it's worth. I mean, with that 14,000 acres and then this castle, I mean... Hundreds of millions. I'm it's assuming. Does someone live there now? Um, gosh, you know what? I it's been a little bit since I put the story together, and I want to say, I, I, I want to say there are like groundskeepers that definitely stay there. Yeah, and it does belong to the royal family. Okay, I, I was wondering how it stays funded. Yeah, for you know groundskeepers, and I mean it's in th- immaculate shape. So <laughs> I think as crazy as it sounds, that it might be like a sometimes home. Like like a, a home you stay at occasionally, like you know, spend a long week. I mean, that's why you bought it for me, <laughs> right? So we can right, sometimes totally. go there. Mm-hmm. A the, sometimes home. Just like Never a nice... heard that phrase before. <laughs> well, like a, I guess like a second or third. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I prefer a sometimes home. A sometimes home. I like yeah. that. I'm the royals home. have so many residences. What's that? A uh, red like there was like something painted on it. Is that, oh, do you see that? Yeah. Oh. Oh. You know what that is? Uh, another picture. That is um, foliage. That's like a, a, oh, a vines. Oh, oh. You know, going up on the castle walls. It's uh, really pretty. Or red blood splatter. I know it does. It does have that tint to it, kind of like blood colored. I've always been impressed. I mean, obviously the castle is beautiful and yeah. impressive, but when they have those um, their gardens. Uh huh. And, and the really shaped hedges and things. Yeah. And then when you look English. at it from an aerial, you or know, British or sorry, UK. Uh, an aerial shot, you know, there'll be like this one. It's yeah. all kind of confined. And then this one, and you can yeah. see like a little yeah, path. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. I, I, I corrected myself quickly there because it has that funny thing of like uh, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, I made this mistake before where it's like, you know, like say British. And I was like, ah, uh, 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 Scottish. <laughs> Not the same. Not the same. Same when you're in like Wales. It's like, no, 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 Welsh. Yeah. Not the same at all. Please do not. Yeah. But I can appreciate that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I can appreciate it too. You know, it's like. People from Iowa don't want to be confused with Idaho, which happens all the <laughs> happens time. Happens all the time. Yes. Um, this next image is an illustration of the Beast of Glam's Castle from the Smithsonian. Okay. There was an exhibit there. And and, and there's an article that, that, that this was associated with. It's kind of interesting. Here, I added this information. Yeah. The article talks about this supposed secret, how it was a source of, like, huge gossip for decades. Weird. Uh, Claude... Bow's Lion, 13th Earl of Strathmore, said, if you could even guess the nature of this castle's secret, you would get down on your knees and thank God it was not yours. He once said that. And the Smithsonian article says, from perhaps the 1840s until 1905, the Earl's ancestral seat at Glam's Castle in the Scottish Lowlands was home to a mystery of mysteries, an enigma that involved a hidden room, a secret passage, solemn initiations, scandal, and shadowy figures glimpsed by night on castle battlements. It was once the talk of Europe. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Super interesting. I, wouldn't it be funny if the secret was really something so stupid? 
Right, 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 right. It was okay. just like where they just met for drinks or something. Yeah, just like some secret little society. Mm-hmm. Just to maybe get people some talking. gambling, or mm-hmm. maybe it was where they hid prostitutes, or you know, I mean, it could be. Right. It could be so many. Well, things. there was stuff like that a lot in Europe. Not to totally deviate everything, but you know, the church was so powerful, mm-hmm. and when the wealthy and the elite wanted to do something like um, gambling or to have you know uh, affairs with mistresses, mm-hmm. you know, they would create these little secret societies, not to do like devil worshiping and all these rumors no. that have sp- spiraled out since, but it was just to do things that if they were caught by the church, they would get in a lot of trouble. In certain periods, they could get like executed. Right. They could lose their land and title. Mm-hmm. And so they had to create little secret societies to just, you know, do things that people now can go to Vegas for. I, in my mind, I was in The Handmaid's Tale. I was at Jezebel's. Ah, like, yes. that kind of thing. And then also, mm-hmm. what was that? Oh man, like somewhere in the '90s, I want to say Joshua Jackson, like the the Skull Society, the, Skull and Bones. Well, I mean, yeah, but there was yeah. a movie. Oh, about it. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't it was see like it. you know a similar. Yeah, I just was mushing the two together. <laughs> I have another two more pictures oh, here. Okay, great. This next one is a kind of a goofy illustration of the Beast of Glam's Castle that comes up in a lot of oh, articles. Oh yeah, very like Quasimodo. Yes. Yeah. And then also uh, this next image comes up a lot when you look for it, which is kind of messed up, but I get it. Uh, Sloth Aww. from Goonies. Right. Sloth. <laughs> right, baby Ruth. He's such a sweet little character. <gasps> I know. Um, so I, I, I wonder if this character is based at least partially uh, on the legend. I mean, probably mm-hmm. sort of Cyclopsy and and, I mean, and and for sorry before I forget for historical kind of experts, I said Edinburgh at one point, which is where the um, Janet was tried uh-huh. and uh, executed. But I, I do realize that's not where Castle Glams is. She's oh, okay. just somebody from the castle that then haunts the castle after her death in another location. Okay, if I didn't make that clear. Oh boy. Yeah, mm-hmm. because I think our show is full of historians. I like to, I like to be accurate. This isn't time suck. It's I okay. Know. You can be a little vague. No <laughs> one's going to persecute you. Uh, okay. When you were telling your story, I had like one thing that I just couldn't stop laughing about in my brain. You kept saying like, Lord, something, something, Angus. I immediately was like, Angus beef. Like I just oh, wanted yeah. a hamburger. Ah, yeah. I'm starving, mm-hmm. uh, which is dumb, but just silly. Uh, you know, the thing about castles... Do you, I would think that almost all castles would be haunted because when you think about how old they are, no one's building a new fucking castle as far as I know. I mean, maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. Not like the old ones. No, because I mean, I think it's similar to... We don't have stonemasons around the same way. Well, and the cost that would be involved. You know, oh, if yeah. you do... Astronomical. Archi- yeah, if you do ever any kind of architectural tour of any city, state, country, yeah. whatever... You know, there's gold and, you know, oh, at, yeah. when you think about even, you know, churches that we've seen, you know, across the world, it's like, right. you can't build that now. So my thought right. is that no one's building new castles and all castles were involved in some sort of turmoil, right? Sure. Like we've gone to Leap Castle all the angel or ones. Lump Castle. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, so, the elemental. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like... Aren't all castles just haunted? Inherently, yeah, I, mean, I would I would they think. They were built in a much bloodier time. Yeah. And, and when there were so many people scheming for titles and things, mm-hmm. where it was like very common for this brother to kill this brother. Right. Or, you know, this cousin to kill like this bro- this uh, cousin's wife, you know, mm-hmm. all this. It was a lot more treachery mm-hmm. inside the walls of these buildings that there tends to be in homes today. Yeah. And, and it just like year after year. Yeah. So if you're going to believe that like a, a, a really tragic kind of murder or accident or whatever can create some kind of energy that then lives on as some kind of poltergeist, ghost, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. it. It does seem if you're going to follow that logic that it's much more likely for a castle to have those things than it would be for some track house. Yeah, I'm like, I'm just not at all surprised yeah. that we were talking about a haunted castle. Right. You know, there's not a lot of like... all haunted, I'm sure. There's not a lot of... <laughs> not to be disparaging to anyone, like I have lived in one of these as a kid, but just on the logic, there's not a lot of like mobile home ghosts. Like, right. because those structures right. don't last that long. Right. And no, and again, not to They're be They're not built to be around for centuries. Well, yes. And also, no one's fighting you to take it. Oh, right. Because that's what I'm thinking yeah. about. Yeah. You know, when you think about castles and fighting for titles right. and fortunes and, you know, people are being married off for hierarchies. Right. It's like, yeah, of course there There's was a lot like of death and destruction thir- around it. The 13th Lord Strathmore of the Vista Hills, you know, mobile home community. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. fighting fighting for that title. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense, too. I was thinking about my childhood home. I'm like, no one's trying to steal that house on Crenshaw Drive. Right, and just yeah. living living in one of those as a kid and, like, some of those those ones that are, like, those pre-manufactured, mm-hmm. in general, they're not built real well. They're not built right. to last. It's, like, cheaper wood and things like that. So they're not going to be handed down 
for many generations. They're oh. going to completely fall apart oftentimes. But isn't the one you grew up in, isn't it still standing? No. Oh, it's not? Mm-mm. So there's some, there's some other place in that location. Oh. I had it in my head for a while that my mom had the same one moved out to Whitebird for Riggins, and that's not the case. That's not the case. They, they had a different, they, they got a different one. So, I mean, yeah. I imagine that one that used to be like where I grew up is, was probably just destroyed. At some point, just demolished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of getting, you know, like after 10 years, it was getting already like a... Uh, you know, the floor was not not even, and well, and houses. It, it was in, it was sat on literal cinder blocks, well, like a couple, a couple yeah. different cinder blocks. And you know, houses in general, yeah, they're just. I mean, we sound so old saying this, but like things just aren't built the way they used to be. But it oh, is true. true. You know, I mean, our, our house is not built anywhere near as strong as like an old craftsman home or right. things like that. And our house was built, you know, the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. And if you compare that to, you know, okay, we're having a huge uh, real estate boom here. Yeah. The rate at which they're building houses around here, it's like you right. can't possibly think that the house that they built in three months is equivalent to a nah. house that they spent years building. Mm-hmm. I mean, efficiency has changed, yes, yeah. but also just the overall craftsmanship, the materials, it just is what it is. I, I like that we're, I feel like we're breaking some new kind of ghost hunty. Uh, we're probably not breaking any new ground. I was thinking that for a second. <laughs> we're just coming to these realizations that other people have, I'm sure, come to before us now, but, that, but I had never thought of that. Uh, of just like the old stone structures, they've just had a lot more lives pass through them. Sure, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know my favorite, favorite, favorite thing to eat in the UK? I think it's specifically uh, English. Beans on toast. Yes, that's my favorite breakfast, but also I love a pickle and cheese sandwich. Branston pickle. It's like mm. so delicious. And I was thinking about it when you were telling that story because I bought some a few weeks ago and I opened up the the hatch of my car and it rolled out and just smashed all over the floor and the garage and it's you know it's pickle so it stank so mad mine bangers and mash easy easy Mm -hmm. shocking meat and potatoes sausage mashed potatoes peas brown onion gravy fuck yeah bro it's so Idaho of you (laughs) that is like the most Americanized kind of thing that you could get it's, it's, it's not, a, it's it's not a very British, yeah. It is, but it's like the most, uh, it, it translates mm-hmm. so easily. Yep, yep. Yep. Any Anywhere you can get a meat and potato situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're real adventurous. <laughs> no, you're a more adventurous eater than I am. I'm just teasing but you. But I do gravitate towards comfort foods when they're on the menu. Yeah. Well, yeah. I th- that's, that's normal. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. Oh, I know what I was going to say earlier that I just wanted to address really quickly. I knew okay. that there was something. We have been getting a lot of emails about like, hey, your ads aren't playing. And so we just haven't oh, talked about yes. this in a really long time. We are just future-proofing episodes. So yeah. sometimes when we get a sponsor, it encompasses the back catalog and the new catalog. Yeah. So if you hear us say like, oh, we're pausing for a sponsor break and then nothing happens, don't worry. It's okay. It's come, It's intentional. Yeah, for whatever reason on this show, it's coming kind of flurries Yeah, where we'll have gaps of like no ads and we'll have gaps of quite a few ads. And so uh, if we don't do that, then when those extra ads are thrown in, th- they just get like crammed randomly in the middle of stories. Right, and it could really break up the flow yeah. of the story and it could ruin it. So we intentionally put those breaks in there. I, I love that you guys are so invested. You're yes, like, thank hey, you. I don't want you to be missing out on your sponsorship. Yeah, It's been really you. sweet, but I just mm-hmm. wanted to... And thank you for growing the show through the ratings and reviews, which means that we're that much more likely to continue to get more sponsors down the road. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, because we love doing this. You guys are so helpful. Okay, are you ready? Yes. My one big, fat, juicy story. Get into it. Who's your squishy this week? I got a little Jason Voorhees squishy He's that, so that an cute. anonymous creep or peeper sent in. Sorry, we didn't we don't have up? a name because uh, we don't have. Uh, it came from Amazon with no, with no gift name. receipt, which sometimes I know you just mm-hmm. can't do. He doesn't. There He's he so cute. He's a little tiny Jason Voorhees. <laughs> I love, love, love him. Uh, so this story takes us to a family living in a one hundred plus year old home so interesting kind of a little thematic with your castle and it caused at least one family member to no longer be able to sleep with their uh, back turned to a room after Uh. so many things happening and i was just thinking you know i know that we talk about buying real estate a lot because right because houses tend to be haunted we talk a lot about a haunted house right i just wonder like how could you know? What if you moved into a house and everything was fine? Like, what if just one day it started happening? Yeah. I mean, there's no... There, it's almost like saying, like, oh, you know, when I bought this house, I never thought it would flood. Okay, like, I think about, like, our right, neighbors, right. their house is sinking. I know, because, that's a freak way I Right? But it's just, like, all these things can happen that when you move in, don't start yeah. until years later. Mm-hmm. I just think the ghosts can come out at any time. Yeah. I think you're never safe. Great. Okay. 
I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> All right. So diving right in. It's a pretty intense story. Okay. I feel as though my family and I are lucky to be alive after what we experienced and survived. I will never forget the sound, the terror that engulfed my body one particularly awful night. Let me set the stage for this family haunting. Only or on Onley Springs, Colorado is a small town of about 300 people. It is in the desolate desert part of the state with dirt roads and nothing but a prison about a mile outside of the town and train tracks with a highway rolling right down the center. This town is notorious for mysterious deaths on the train tracks and big rigs killing people on the highway. The whole town has always felt creepy and ominous. My parents, George and Donna, had moved to this town from California shortly after they married. Here they had four children, Sarah, Abby, Lydia, and William. As the family was growing, we needed to find a new home to accommodate all of us. Across the tracks from where we currently resided, my parents found a two-story home on a corner lot of a neighborhood. The records showed that it was the oldest house in town. In the late 1800s, it was a brothel for the railroad workers and then eventually evolved into the only hotel in town until it was privately sold and used as a residence. The rumors were that some railroad workers killed some of the brothel workers and that some kind of treasure was huh. hidden somewhere on the property. This house was over 100 years old when my family moved in during the spring of 2000. My eldest sister, Sarah, was seven, I was five, Lydia was three, and my brother William came along shortly after we moved into the home. The home had a large, large front porch with southern-style pillars. In the center of the porch, there was the front door. As you entered the door, you would immediately be at the bottom of the stairs. To the left was the open living room that overflowed into the dining room. Then a large door to the right went into the kitchen that overflowed into a parlor of sorts, which we called the computer room because it was used as my parents' office. The whole downstairs made a sort of circle, room to room going around the staircase. As you came up the very steep stairs and stood on the landing, my parents' room was to the far right. Next to their room was mine. Directly in front of the stairs was a bathroom that was gutted and never was finished. To the left was my little sister Lydia's room, and at the far left was Sarah's room. Lydia and Sarah had a room that their room had an adjoining closet, which contained the attic door. Moving into the home was exciting as a kid. I remember my parents saying that the owner of the home had passed away and that it went up for sale sometime later when they purchased it. I remember entering the house for the first time. It was dark and dusty. It had those dark shadows like only an old home can have. One feature that stood out to me was that every window in the home had been lined with foil from the inside, blocking out almost all the light. You got the sense that no matter where you went in the house, you were always being watched. The home was severely out of date when we moved in. My family began to remodel, room by room, making it our own. For the first two years, all was quiet. Old homes have squeaks and groans, it's to be expected, so no one really noticed anything. When I was seven, my parents decided one night to goof around with my aunt. While all of us kids were asleep, they decided they wanted to have a seance. And they thought the best place in the house for this was the adjoining closets between my sister's rooms. My dad, ever the skeptic, mocked and complained the entire time. As my aunt was asking the spirits if they were present, my dad ripped the raunchiest fart ever, <laughs> sending my mom and aunt running from the closet in disgust as my dad laughed. However, after that night, the trouble started. At first, it was small things, like things going missing. Toys, jewelry, clothing, and so on. My mother, having four kids, always blamed one of us and thought absolutely nothing more of it. One day, my mother was home, starting her day, when she heard something that sounded like... that sounded like she... Oh, oh it's weird. One day, my mom was home and she heard something that sounded like footsteps. As she walked into her bedroom for further inspection, she found that the sound was coming from her bedroom. The doorknob was, was gently opened and continually bounced off the wall over and over. The door bounced like this day and night, uh. nonstop. My parents chalked it up to a draft in the house and just moved on. The trouble with doors in our house continued when the front door started opening all by itself. We would wake up in the morning to find the front door wide open. Sometimes we would just be sitting on the couch and we could see the door and it would just pop open. 
It never came just slightly ajar. It always came widely and fully and slowly open. My parents tried everything to solve the problem. They changed the lock, they mm -hmm. rebuilt the door frame, but still the door came open. My parents blamed the high winds in the area and did their best to keep it shut and moved on from it. A while after the door started acting up, late one night, my mom decided to come sleep in my bed with me because my dad snores something terrible. I mean, it was wall-shaking, ear-breaking snores. I smushed next to the wall so she could get into my twin bed with me and promptly fell asleep. As my mom lay there trying to block out my dad's snores, she noticed movement in a dark corner of my room. She turned to see from where she was lying my large red bouncy ball bouncing in the dark corner. Boing, boing, <laughs> boing. The ball bounced its way right up to the bedside where she was lying. She quickly woke me up and took me downstairs to sleep on the futon in the computer room. She laid me down and then rushed back upstairs for fear someone had broken in. After all, the front door never stayed shut. She turned on the lights and looked everywhere, in every corner, and found nothing. A few days after the red bouncing ball incident, Sarah and I got in a fight while playing. Since I had kicked my sister, I was sent to my room to take an afternoon nap. I was laying there, face down, mad I had to take a nap. I scooched to the edge of the bed and noticed something rather alarming. I looked down at my floorboards and noticed my bed skirt was moving in and out, Ugh. in and out. It was as if something was under my bed with its face pushed up against the bed skirt, breathing, waiting, watching. I leapt from my bed, sobbing to my mother who was in the kitchen. She said that I was just imagining things and that all I wanted was to get out of taking a nap. And that's what I told myself as I tried to push it from my mind. At night, when we woke up to use the restroom, it was easier to use the one upstairs at the top of the landing, even though it was unfinished and rather creepy. The toilet worked just fine. The only issue that is that that bathroom didn't have a door. So one night, Sarah got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. She, half awake, half asleep, stumbled to the bathroom. She sat doing her business when she heard something right outside the bathroom door. The only light that worked was the one at the landing at the top of the stairs just outside the bathroom. As she looked out at the landing, she saw a tall, dark man in suspenders walk by the door. She summoned the courage to dart across the landing into my mother's room, where she immediately woke her up and told her what she had seen. My mom said she was probably just not fully awake and imagining things. The next day, we went somewhere as a family, arriving home late at night. As we came into the house, we could distinctly smell cigars and a very strong men's mm. cologne. It smelled in every room. As we came into Lydia's room, it smelled as if it was originating from the joint closet. My dad was clearly worried, thinking a man had broken into our home. He pushed us out onto the landing as he stormed through every room, calling out, Who's there? Show yourself! He searched everywhere, but came up with nothing. Soon after this, we took a trip. My grandparents live in California, so my mom and us kids flew out to see them for a week or so to take our minds off of everything going on in the house. Mm -hmm. My dad couldn't come with us because of work. One evening, while we were gone, he sat up on the couch trying to enjoy a movie when he heard stomping and running upstairs, accompanied by dresser drawers slamming shut. In an angry fit of annoyance, he threw down the remote and started up the stairs. When he suddenly remembered, we were all gone. He was alone. He was frozen in place while the noise upstairs continued. He slowly backed down the stairs and chose to continue watching his movie. The sounds eventually stopped without explanation. That night, as he slept alone in the house, he woke to the feeling that he was being watched. He opened his eyes to find a woman with long hair inches from his face. From the corner of his eye, he could also see the man in suspenders standing at the end of his bed. In the most threatening voice he could muster up, he simply told them to go away, rolled over, and went back to sleep. <laughs> Sometime later, after I turned eight, I was downstairs and had just finished showering. I wrapped a towel around my bed, around my body, and headed upstairs to grab my PJs. As I came up the stairs, a strong wind chilled and pulled around my legs. By the time I got to the landing, I was absolutely freezing. I flipped on the light in my room and began to cry because of what I saw in front of me. The window next to my bed had been ripped from the frame and was nicely leaning up against my bed frame. The glass was not shattered. The frame had not fallen out of the wall. It was simply ripped from the wall, carried Weird. three feet away, and set down. My parents were now beside themselves. They had no explanation. Everyone talked and agreed that something was for sure going on in the house. 
My parents had put everything they had into this house, so we couldn't just up and move. But we will come to regret that decision later. On another late night, my dad snoring extremely loud as he does, my mom went to Sarah's room for respite. Sarah had the only queen bed out of all of us kids. She lay there, dozing off, next to my sister, when she heard a faint sound. Click, click, click. She could hear the sound but couldn't see the source. It was followed by a knock, knock, knock. She heard it again, louder. It was coming from the joint closet. Sarah had awoken and her also asked my mom if she heard the sounds. And then, slam! Three loud bangs. And then the closet door flung open, slamming into the wall while a rush of air blew past the bed and out the bedroom door. They both fled the room, running down to the computer room to sleep on the futon for the night. With all of the strange and scary things going on in the house and the feelings of always being watched, us kids grew scared to sleep in our own bedrooms. We all began to cram onto the futon every night. On another night, with my dad snoring, sending my mom out of their bedroom with frustration, she took my infant brother downstairs to join us on the futon. She laid him down and then went to the kitchen to make him a bottle. Mm -hmm. She heated the water, and as she was shaking the formula, she heard someone step onto the landing upstairs. The footsteps began to steadily come down the stairs. Each and every step had a specific creak. We could identify where someone was on the stairs by the squeaks. My mom called out from the kitchen, George, the kids are sleeping. Be quiet. No response. The footsteps hit the floor at the bottom of the stairs and began to come through the living room. She called again, George? Still, silence. The footsteps moved from the living room into the dining room. They were headed straight for the kitchen. George, this isn't funny, my mom says. The steps came right up to the kitchen door, just outside where the kitchen light could reach. Something was standing in the black darkness. Terrified, my mom ran to the futon, woke up Sarah, and had her sit up with her for the rest of the night. My parents didn't share these stories with us until we were much older. In fact, we all had strange things happen to us that we didn't share until we got older. But anyways, I digress. Everything had been fairly harmless until this final event. Every member of my family can tell you exactly what happened next. Every detail could be shared like it was yesterday. Late one stormy night, my mom woke us up around 2 a.m. The power had gone out and she wanted us to come sleep in Sarah's room altogether. She lit a candle and placed it on the dresser and then went to her room. We climbed into bed, me closest to the wall, Lydia in the middle, and Sarah closest to the door. The lightning shot across the sky and the thunder clapped, on top of my dad's snoring seemingly being louder than we had ever heard. We lay there, trying to sleep. We were dozing off until we heard it. We heard something begin to climb the stairs, starting Uh. from the base of the staircase. We could hear it slowly and steadily climb the steps as each step creaked and moaned. It was making a different kind of sound as it came up the stairs. It didn't sound as if it was walking, but rather climbing. It was the sound of four feet instead of two. We strained to hear the sounds through my dad's snores. We could only get a second of two or listening in between the snores. Sarah asked, Do you hear that? I barely squeaked out a yes. I turned to Lydia in the middle, and she was lying there, frozen in fear, silently crying. We continued to hear it, climbing, one step at a time, until it hit the landing at the top of the stairs. I am now 25 years old, and I'm trying not to cry as I write this. We will never forget that sound. Whatever it was made it to the top of the landing when we heard it slam each of its arms onto the floor with nails scraping the wooden floor beneath it. Clack, clack, clack. Then it began to move. We heard it clack, clack, schlack, clack, clack, schlack, dragging itself over the floor. We heard it over and over, the nails hitting the floor and the sound of it dragging itself across towards the bedroom. It began to crawl closer and closer to Sarah's room. We strained to hear it through the snores as it got closer. When it was just outside the bedroom door, we could hear it breathing in a raspy, choked, watery-sounding breath. It sounded strained and wheezy. We all began to silently sob. No one could turn their head to look at the demon as it slid into the room and slunk right underneath the bed. We could hear it clear as day, all three of us awake and listening. We lay there for what felt like hours when the sheets on my side of the bed suddenly went taut. The sheets began to be pulled under the bed. We all started screaming, shouting for my mother. We heard her sprint across the landing. As she approached the door to Sarah's room, she heard it too. She froze. She was so terrified she couldn't even enter the room herself. All she could manage was to scream at us, Jump! 
We each jumped as far as we could off the bed one by one. I was the last one to leap as my feet left the mattress. The sheets zipped off the bed and were sucked underneath. My mom grabbed my baby brother and we all ran downstairs. As we came down, we saw that the front door was once again wide open. We piled onto the couch in the darkness as the lightning shot and the thunder clapped. Each of us was staring up at the stairs, afraid of what might come down. I didn't sleep a wink that night watching those stairs. Nothing ever did come down. We are all still haunted by that night. Whatever came that night wanted us kids and we could feel it. That kind of terror never leaves. That kind of fear is unreal. We moved to California to be with family after that night. My parents knew that they could not keep their family safe in that home any longer. The home remained empty until an older couple purchased it some years later. They were very well liked in the community. They were the social sort. Living across the street from my old house was my aunt. She called my parents a few years after we moved out with harrowing news. She said she had not seen her neighbors in a few days, and so she reported a wellness check, only to find out that the new owners were both dead. The husband had killed his wife and then shot himself. According to the locals, the bodies had begun to decompose, and the blood in the old computer room was so bad that it had to be cut out of the flooring and parts of the walls in order to remove it all. Every window in the home was lined with foil once again. I firmly believe that whatever was in there, it wanted our lives that night and then manifested itself in another way to take the lives of the new owners. I still cannot sleep with my back to an open room. I always have to be facing the room. Always. Love you guys. Looking forward to the future podcasts. Stay scary. Abby. Abby, wow. Intense, that's, yeah. That's an extremely intense story. Uh-huh. I don't I don't know if it's like <sighs> this story or what has been hanging out in my brain, but I have been so freaked out lately. Yeah, yeah, you went went back to being like you were very relaxed for several months. Mm-hmm. And now you're um uh a, a little more on edge again. Uh-huh. I, I can always tell because um we sleep with our two dogs in the bed with us. Yes. And they love in like such a crazy way to be in between us <laughs> like especially ridiculous. penny like penny will fight with every like she'll drag she'll put her claws out and just try to like please do not move me from this spot she and, wants to be immediately in between our heads <laughs> and then when you move her if you don't move quick enough she mm-hmm. immediately jumps back into that spot yep she scoots back there and then she acts pissy uh-huh. for a little while once she's been moved so anyway and she's like dead weight she will not <laughs> let you move her she is ridiculous Ridiculous. Yeah, she's a huge brat about it. Yeah, and last night I saw you guys, you you were on your side, you had huh? your arm over Penny, oh she boy. was snuggling, she was facing me, and I hate when there's breath in huh? my face, huh? and her hot little dog breath was nailing my <laughs> nose. I was so mad. If I can't get her to move, I was like, mm-hmm. Penny! And then she kind of like moved her head up, like, sorry, mom. <laughs> and, and normally we're just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. We just leave like that. But sometimes when you're like, no, will you, will you just move the dogs? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, she's freaked out. Yeah, I tend to say things like, hold me all night long. Don't let go. (laughs) (laughs) As if that's going to stop anything. Uh, Right. Or you also know that I'm completely freaked out when I need to sleep on your side of the bed and then I push you closer to the mirror. That's what that's about. (laughs) Right, right. So then I can turn my back to the mirror, but then I'm facing the closet. So that's like a little bit spooky. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and then the other night... My sleep paralysis happened. Uh Okay, so this has never happened to me in my life. Obviously, we've done loads of sleep paralysis stories from fans that, again, you know, I always feel a bit more connected to. They feel a bit more real to me. Yes. You've had stories that you've told. So we went to bed. I was totally freaked out. I was having a really hard time falling asleep. I finally, like, such a hard time sleeping to the point of, like, I'm lying there with my eyes closed and I'm like, Looking around the room. I mean, this Mm -hmm. goes on for an hour every night now. It's impossible to fall asleep. Okay. It's not funny. Why are you laughing at me? It kind of is. For for for, when you're when it's not you, it's kind of funny. No, it's not. For me, for me thinking about you. How do you feel? No sympathy for me that I'm like exhausted. (laughs) That you're fine. Am I? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm glad you think so. (laughs) So I finally fall asleep, and I was having some sort of you know nightmare. Yeah. I cannot recall what it was at all. I have no details to share with you, except that towards the end of it, I was screaming in my dream, like really aggressively, angrily, 
screaming, like a loud, blood-curdling scream. Yeah. And in my mind, I was awake. So I couldn't understand why you weren't soothing me and finding out like what was wrong. <laughs> right. And there was this very strange disconnect where I was definitely sleeping, but I definitely thought I was awake. And by the time I woke up, I was gasping for breath because I'd been screaming so hard in my dream. And I, again, thought I was screaming out loud that I thought I was going like, Dan, Dan, like I thought. And then when I finally woke up and you were sound asleep fucking snoring, mm -hmm. I was like, wait, was I not screaming? Was that... Like, you what? were screaming. I remembered you screaming, but I was just like, I'm so tired. I don't I don't feel like dealing with this. But I do remember you were screaming and you sounded really scared. And I was just like, not, not tonight. And I was just like, I, I gotta get some sleep. You're hilarious. No, no, I don't remember. I really that. wish I had something to throw at you. Like I was thinking I about this cross <laughs> and then I thought it could actually really hurt you. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember it. But, and then I woke yeah. you up. I was like, oh my God, I just had such a bad dream. Was I screaming? And you were mm -hmm. like, no, I was certain I was screaming. And it, and you've had sleep paralysis, I think you yeah. said a few times. It is so, um, what is the word I want? Dis, uh, not, uh, disconcerting? I was thinking disconcerting, but I don't know if that's the right word. Yeah. You're just, you feel so disconnected from your body. It's mm -hmm. so bizarre. And I didn't have it's like. Very surreal. Yeah. yeah. The experience. And I didn't have, like, I didn't see any like shadows or, you know, I, I didn't think something was like, I didn't see like hands. Like I, Logan yeah. and I were talking about this before where he said he's had it before where there were like hundreds of like black hands Ugh. trying to get him. Like I Who did said that Logan. Yikes. I didn't have anything like that. I just felt <clears throat> scared and in fear. Yeah. And I was so certain that I had been awake for such a long period of time and that I was really clearly upset about it. It was hard to fall asleep. Then, I mean, that was a couple nights ago. I'm still having a hard time falling asleep because I'm afraid it's going to happen again. Right. It's fucked up, man. Now I'm thinking of another horror movie. We always think about him here. I'm thinking like, what if I'm not me? I'm a. Oh my god, stop! I'm a doppelganger. Stop! Hold on, let me finish. As, no, I don't <laughs> want you to fucking finish. I'm the one who can't sleep. I'm, You're making it worse. <laughs> and then I'm pretending to comfort you, and you think, but like, really, I'm the reason all this stuff is happening. And I'm just laying there with my eyes open, and I'm talking, communicating telepathically to all these little demon things mm -hmm. who are tormenting you. And what then, if? And then you seek comfort for me, but I'm the leader. Well, considering that I'm not truly afraid of doppelgangers the way you are, yeah. what if I am pretending to have sleep paralysis? Mm. What if it's not really me and it's all a trick you're for, the, you, to, for the... you to comfort me and then me God, doppelganger just get me. fucking gets you? Oh, no. I hope you can't sleep tonight. <laughs> It also doesn't help that we're doing like dry January. So I like, I don't have my uh, booze to knock me out. I don't weed. have my weed to knock me out. I'm just mm -hmm. lying there like fucking jacked up. Mm -hmm. So scared. It's terrible. It is terrible. It's fucking terrible. I hope you, I hope you get some more sleep. Do you? I do. Okay. I don't want you to not get sleep. Well, it, I mean, two minutes ago you wanted me to laughing. not get no, sleep. No, no, I, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, but mm -hmm. I hope you get some sleep. Uh huh. Okay. So anyways, I got totally off track. I wanted to show you. Oh, yes, you have some uh, pictures, pictures of the house. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I just... Uh, okay, so that's the house. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks completely, in my opinion, normal, just like an older house. At night, that house would look creepy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just that, that style of home. Uh, I, I'm reminded of some uh, horror movies because it's that style of home, whatever, it's like it looks like a face where those two windows are the eyes. Oh. And then that little um, uh, thing coming over the front door is the nose. The Eve? And the, the Eve and then the door is the mouth. Oh, yeah. funny! I've never thought of a house that way. Okay, mm -hmm. I've never. I, I don't. I, I'm not great with architectural terms, but whatever style of home that is, yeah, I could see that being a haunted house. If, if that if that picture was at night, yeah, just some interesting shadows and stuff. What's it, what's it called when you apply human traits to personification? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now we have just another angle of the house, just a little bit, you know, the side angle. And these are just Google Maps. Yeah. Um, I, I did cut oh, yeah. out the address. Huh, the little Google Map arrows, yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Abby sent this, and I decided to not include the address. And it looks like it has a little in the back there that might be some kind of entrance to a cellar, perhaps? I can't oh, tell. I it might just it be like, a little back room. Yeah, I thought it was like a back little patio, like oh, sun porch yeah. or something. Okay. And then just to verify for sure that that couple, this mm -hmm. third picture is just a screenshot of the article oh wow coroner deceased found in Ol Olney springs home died from murder suicide damn yep and i mean that is wow. for sure the house you see i mean you can match that door up to the other photos Ugh, that's crazy i know the foil lined windows particularly freaks me out that yeah. it was there when they moved in, yeah. they took it down, and Eek. then it was back. That's creepy. That's Now I got the chills, yeah. I know. There's some weird house on 15th here. Mm -hmm. Kate actually pointed it out to me. She's like, uh -huh. what's going on there? All of the windows from the outside are covered. 
in like a like wooden slats over uh. the window and it's painted the same color of the house like it's some weird style choice weird yeah but it is it i really want to talk are to they those keeping people something in or are they trying to keep something out i don't know and the house is perfectly maintained otherwise like it's not dilapidated but i never actually see people coming in and out mm -hmm. i see a car there and the windows are fucking covered Eek. i'll show it to you Okay. Okay. Do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs? I do. I do. Let's, do some, me, let's have some light. Do you want me to do it first or you, you first? normally oh, go first? Yeah. Okay. I'll do it first. And before I do it, and again, thanks again for the ratings and reviews recently. We, we do appreciate it so much, Creeps and Peepers, and it does help us find uh, listeners, uh, you know, very effectively. So we appreciate it. And we appreciate our Patreon supporters. We appreciate our Annabelle's Brent Kelly, Joe Dawson, Marvin D, Austin Engel, Kimberly Lewis, Eric Barber, Amanda Ladendecker. Joseph Giacoletto, uh, Pilar Zaremski, <laughs> and Nikita Brigmohan. Nice. <laughs> I tried to smash all the tough ones together. Yeah, yeah. I should have looked at them before. Z oh, man, that one. The, again, even though like I'm used to like your Polish, you know, former name, like Rad Zaremski. 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 It always takes me a second. Yeah. With those. And Eric Barber, man, he's like a longtime space loser too, right? Yes. That, yeah, name that is very, rings very familiar. Me too. I was mm -hmm. like, very, I'm, very I'm, familiar. You know, because you have these interactions online. Yeah. And certain names just pop up over and over. I was like, I, yep. I know who you are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have some grateful Annabelle shout outs to Ariel Olson, Megan Ann Morris, Angelo Angelino, Kayla Roop, Rachel Ross, Jennifer Gray. Elizabeth, no last name, Aaron Mc McGlinsey, Abigail Stevens, and Nicole Herman. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then I have some spoopy shout outs. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Sending some spoopy shout outs to Chelsea from Jade. Happy belated birthday to Nina. Oh boy, your significant other has a very challenging name. <sighs> Pan, Panayotis? Panayotis. I wrote out a phonetic spelling, but nice. man. So to Nina from Panayotis, sending you some love. Uh, this is to get him out of the doghouse. He apparently oh, was supposed okay. to like do this for her birthday, her anniversary. Right. He really mucked it up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, to Jose from your mom, Diana. She thanks you for not only making her a mom, but now a first time grandma. Aww. To Nolan from Stony, aka your dada. I love you. And to Isaac from Janelle and Monica from, oh, I'm sorry, to Isaac, Janelle, and Monica from your dad and husband, Gabriel. He loves you. And I believe also a happy anniversary to Monica. Oh, very nice. Very nice. And that is all for today. Uh, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. And thanks to Logan Keith for the social media post creation and for badmagicmerch.com merch designs. Uh, store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service. Uh, thanks to producer Sophie Evans for help with story curation and creation. Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. And to Zach Cohen and Joe for custom sound bed creation. And thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. If you want to watch in addition to listen, please subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and to see pictures from today's show and all the shows at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with over 12,000 members for horror lovers to meet more horror lovers. Thanks to Liz Hernandez for moderating. If you don't want to hear ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, merch discounts, uh, to, to contribute to our donations and more, please check out our Patreon. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.